Hello and welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. This is going to be our final episode of PV Markets and Applications. That's part three. And in this episode, we're going to learn about AC PV modules, direct PV systems, water pumping with PV, self-regulating PV, hybrid PV systems versus hybrid inverters, the Solar Living Institute, may it rest in peace. Yes, I'm sorry to inform you that the Solar Living Institute has gone out of business. That was a great place and I'm very sad to see it go. Pumped hydroelectric storage, utility scale solar farms, large scale PV electric supply stations, that's National Electrical Code Article 691, PV feed-in tariffs, next tracker single axis trackers, Distributed Generation, NABCEP, Community Solar, Community Choice Aggregation, that's CCAs, and by the way, Community Choice Aggregation is different from Community Solar. And then we look at the Solar Energy Industry Association, how many houses you can power with a megawatt, and it comes out to be about six kilowatts per house average. And we're gonna talk about energy efficiency, a resistance heater that's 100% efficient versus heat pumps that are three times better than that. Go figure, you can't get higher than 100% or can you? What's the trick here? That's breaking the laws of thermodynamics. Let's break the law. And last, what we're gonna talk a little bit about here is Spectrolab. That's a Boeing company that makes space solar. That's what you see on the space station. It's made out of stuff called gallium arsenide. So to learn about all this stuff and more, go to solarsean.com. Now, on with the show. Here we are at markets and application technology number three. Let's move on to AC modules. It includes the inverter. The difference between an AC module versus a regular old DC module with a microinverter attached to it is that the AC module had the microinverter and the module listed and tested after it was put together as a unit. So don't go out thinking you're just going to grab a microinverter and a module, slam them together and turn that into an AC module officially. I mean, but hey, it'll work the same pretty much. Direct PV system. All we have electrically is PV and a load. Nothing else. No inverters. No batteries. But of course, there is that free energy source called the sun. The most common type of direct coupled PV system is a water pump. You see these water pumps up in the California foothills. You see them on farms, watering cows. You see them in developing countries where they don't have electrical systems. And it's just pretty simple and straightforward. The sun comes out and it pumps water. But you can see that it's also a little bit complicated sometimes on the water pumping side. So you see all these different terms such as total dynamic head and things like that. That's where it can get a little bit confusing when you wanna pump water up a hill. You might want to work with a distributor who sells these types of systems with this when you're getting into a system that is going to have to pump up some elevation. All these systems are different and I've seen quite a few of them. They're pretty neat. If you are going to boost the current, you're going to have to reduce the voltage. So essentially it is a type of a DC to DC converter that will in the morning when the sun is not shining directly on the PV increase the current so you can get that pump kicking over. And the way that that happens is a swap. It's sort of like a transformer, but transformers only work for AC. So this is for DC. So we're just swapping out some voltage for some current. As PV gets less and less expensive, people will even do hot water heating with PV. This has two different elements. One of them is hooked up to the grid and one of them is hooked up to the PV. And a self-regulating system is something that's very unusual. It has a battery, but no charge controller. So essentially what you're doing is you are using the characteristics of PV in the IV curve and careful design planning, and you're also sizing the system so it doesn't charge so fast, so you don't charge it more than 3% in one hour. That was at one time a test question on the NAPSEP associate exam. However, I haven't heard of it being there in quite a while. And it is actually the last thing that you see in Article 690. Hybrid. Hybrid has different definitions depending on who you talk to. But if we're talking about the National Electrical Code, which NABSEP bases its tests on, hybrid means that it's a PV system with another source of power besides utility or batteries. So therefore, batteries do not make a hybrid system like they do in my hybrid car, which does not go by the National Electrical Code. Cars do not go by the National Electrical Code. 
Sometimes there's people out there selling hybrid inverters. And what they mean by that is that it does work with PV and batteries. That's not an NEC thing, but that apparently is a thing on the trade show floors. One of the ways you might differentiate between these things is hybrid pertains to system in the NEC. And when they're talking about an inverter, then they mean PV and batteries, but they could mean PV and wind. And so your most typical hybrid system would be PV with a generator, but you can also have hybrid being PV and wind, PV and micro hydro, PV and you pedaling your bicycle with something that you invented to make muscle power. I've also seen something kind of interesting. I saw this one band and they powered their electric guitar from a bicycle. So this guy was just riding his bike. He stops, puts it on this thing, pedals it, and all of a sudden he's powering an electric guitar. Then there's another place called the Solar Living Institute, and you go up there, it's Hopland, it's in Northern California, and they have bicycles that you can pedal, and it lights up LED Christmas lights. Kind of cool. Let us talk about why PV is the best. PV works when you need the electricity the most. That's when the sun is out. That's when people are awake. Wind is great, but it doesn't blow reliably. And sometimes you have too much wind power. Sometimes you don't have enough for longer periods of time. But it's actually a really good complement for PV. Wind has moving parts. PV doesn't have moving parts. Wind and solar together are taking over. They are becoming cheaper than fossil fuel. That's called grid parity. One of the reasons that we even still have coal plants is somebody made such a big investment in that coal plant. And in order to pay for that investment, they have to let that thing run for another 10 years. And in some cases, they're finding out it's even cheaper to decommission the coal plant that has another 10, 20, 30 years left in its life and to replace that with something like PV. PV works great for pumped hydro storage. So pumped hydro, that's the number one energy storage in the world where you pump water uphill to store energy. However, hydroelectric sometimes disturbs rivers and there's only so much in the world. Hydro was our first choice of energy when electricity was newer, but then we needed more and there was just not enough things to dam up, darn it. So then fossil fuels became a big thing and now we are using semiconductor crystals in sunlight. That is the future. Let's talk about big scale PV. We call that utility scale solar farms or utility scale solar parks. And these things are way too big for net metering. Net metering is when you are offsetting your loads. Utility scale solar farms, they're power plants. And it's almost like they shouldn't even have to comply with the NEC because other power plants don't. We don't see nuclear power. We don't see coal power. We don't see natural gas power plants in the NEC. But since PV is in the NEC because PV is modular, that means you can have small systems and giant systems, then there's something in the NEC about PV. And then the AHJs and the building inspectors they like to go inspect things. So some of the solar farms out there are non-NEC compliant. They are just considered utilities. And utilities do not have to follow the NEC. We also have Article 691, which is for large-scale PV electric supply stations. One of the criteria is that these PV systems have to be over 5 megawatts, and then there's a lot less rules. And just to scale things for you, oftentimes a megawatt takes between 4 and 10 acres of land. Other countries a lot of times have something called a feed-in tariff, so let's just mention that. Once in a while, there's been a feed-in tariff in the United States. It was a European thing that kicked off the solar industry. They were 20-year contracts for electricity. And also incredible is that solar and wind are now the cheapest sources of power in most of the world. So sorry coal, sorry frackers, sorry fossil fuel industry, sorry dinosaurs. Well, at least you have paleontologists and kindergartners to pay attention to you, you old dinosaurs. Utility scale PV systems are getting bigger and bigger over the years. 20 years ago, a megawatt was huge. Today, there's many people that won't even mess around with something as small as 10 megawatts. And now there are some systems that are a thousand megawatts in this world. Next Tracker, and they're the number one company in the United States for trackers. Their particular tracker is called a single axis tracker. In the morning it faces east, in the afternoon it faces west, and at noon it is completely flat. We'll have different combiner boxes, controllers, and sometimes they'll even have energy storage out in the field. Utility scale versus distributed generation. Utility scale is the big stuff, and distributed generation is usually associated with buildings. One of the terms that you hear a lot is community solar. Community solar works pretty well if people can't put solar on their houses. Maybe they're renters. Maybe they don't have the credit rating. It works good for people without too much money and gets them in on the solar economy. 
So solar isn't just for rich people, as some people have complained. So if you live under a tree, hopefully you can do community solar too. Community choice aggregation is getting more and more popular, also known as CCA. You hear about CCAs all over the place, especially in California and Massachusetts. What happens is a municipality will get together and purchase the electricity themselves, but they don't get the utility out of the picture. The utility still works with the poles and the wires and the distribution and the billing. There are over 1,500 CCAs in the United States right now. Typically, CCA electricity is greener and cheaper. I interviewed a good friend of mine who is also the inventor of CCAs. His name is Paul Finn. So you can check that out on Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. So let's talk about size megawatt capital M, capital W. If you made it a small M, that's a milliwatt, and that's a billion times smaller. So according to SIA, the Solar Energy Industry Association, you can power 164 houses with a megawatt. That's 1,000 kilowatts. That comes out to be six kilowatts per house. If we figured that our average 60 cell residential size PV module was about 300 watts, then that would be about 20 modules per house. Now that would depend on what state you live in. The sunniest states starting with New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, California, Utah, and of course down at the bottom we have the furthest north latitude state which is Alaska. How many kilowatt hours per year we can get out of a kilowatt? So if kind of average it's about 1,500. But then different states use different amounts of electricity. So we have Louisiana, Tennessee, and Alabama, where you can find some cheap coal electricity and some hot, humid weather. Then on the bottom, we have super expensive electricity in Hawaii. And actually, even though Hawaii is in the tropics, they're in the trade winds, and you don't really need much in the way of air conditioning. So even though PV is cheap, Energy efficiency is a great idea, and in many cases, you can get a quicker payback. Remember those incandescent light bulbs? Those weren't really light bulbs. They were heaters that made 10% light, 90% heat. So on the associate exam, you might see some questions about energy efficiency, and one of those questions had to do with a resistance heater. An example of a resistance heater is one of those 1500 watt heaters that you just plug into your wall. Since inefficiency turns into heat and you're just trying to make heat, a resistance heater is about 100% efficient. But if you replaced a brand new resistance heater with a heat pump, that would be a pretty good investment because heat pumps are better than 100% efficient because they can take heat out of different places and bring it to you, such as from the air or from under the ground. There's really no such thing as greater than 100% efficient, but if you do the math, you're gonna get three times more heat for your electricity with a good geothermal heat pump. And the way that that works without violating the laws of thermodynamics is it takes that heat from a different place. And anytime you're over absolute zero, there's some heat somewhere, even on Pluto. And speaking of space, we are coming to the end here, and I just wanted to throw in something that's kind of interesting. Spectrolab, they're the ones that make the solar cells from space. Yes, that's right. If you want to install solar on Mars, call up Spectrolab. They're a Boeing company. Okay, folks, that takes us to the end of Markets and Application Technology 3. Thanks for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. This was PV Markets and Applications Part 3. Next week, we're going to cover something that makes you alive. It's called safety. To find out more about solar and storage, go to solarsean.com.